extension of the same uh, uh, process in lecture. Now, here you can see the obstructive lung diseases basically in, include conventionally, theoretically, these uh, four entities, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, bronchial asthma, and bronchiectasis. Uh, this is a diagram which is basically showing uh, that these uh, diseases do not exist as distinct or separate entities. There is a fair amount of overlap between emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and same is true with bronchial asthma. So emphysema may have an element of chronic bronchitis, and chronic bronchitis may have an element of asthma or emphysema and vice versa. So these diseases, theoretically, we basically discuss them as separate entities, but in fact, they overlap uh, most of the time. Now, this is the case one. Uh, now, in case one, uh, a 38-year-old woman has uh, experienced multiple bouts of severe necrotizing pneumonia with hemophilus influenza, Staph aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Serratia species cultured from her sputum since childhood. She now suffers for a week at a time with cough productive of large amount of purulent sputum. So this is a case in which a middle-aged woman has multiple bouts of respiratory tract infection, and that infection is a severe one, severe one because it has been labeled as necrotizing pneumonia. So pneumonia is, is a severe inflammation uh, with infection of the lungs, having necrotizing sort of inflammation. Now she suffers for weeks at a time with a cough productive of large amount of purulent sputum. So, she is coughing, <clears throat> she, have, uh, she has copious amount of uh, sputum and the sputum is purulent. On physical examination, there is dullness to percussion with decreased breath sounds over the right mid to lower lung fields. Chest radiograph shows areas of right lower lobe consolidation. Non-percussion, we have a percussion uh, node, not all over the lungs, but right mid to lower lung fields, so it's the right side and the right lower half of the lungs show dull percussion note. Uh, chest radiograph shows right lower lobe consolidation. Consolidation is a word which is specific for uh, an pneumonia and basically it depicts uh, uh, the loss of air in that area and the air is being replaced by edema fluid or uh, purulent uh, sort of uh, discharge or exudation. Bronchoscopy shows marked dilation of right lower lobe bronchi. Now, uh, this is another finding. So, in this case, we have uh, a middle aged woman who is suffering from uh, multiple episodes of uh, necrotizing pneumonia since her childhood. Now, she has exaggeration of the same process with production of copious amount of purulent sputum. Purulent sputum means infected sputum, not just mucus. There's a difference between mucus and sputum, which is a purulent one. So it means she had severe infection and inflammation. And because of this severe infection and inflammation, there is loss of air in the right lower lobe of the lungs. And that uh, air is being replaced by pus or purulent discharge. Pus is basically a fluid containing various inflammatory cells and necrotizing debris of the tissue. On physical examination, there is on auscultation, there is of course reduction in the breath sounds in the right lower lung fields because of consolidation. And consolidation, as I have told you, is simply a replacement of the air containing pockets in the lung by uh, exudate or fluid. So bronchoscopy shows marked dilation of right lower lobe bronchi this dilution of bronchi is specific to this condition. This condition basically we are discussing in the context of uh, obstructive lung diseases. Now here is the uh, 
gross photograph of uh, this sort of uh, patient having this sort of lung and condition. Here you can see <clears throat> that in this uh, lower section or lower half of the lung, we have these dilated bronchi. Usually these bronchi are not that much dilated and that much fixed in dilation. So this is something abnormal. Okay. Uh, this dilation is because of recurrent infections and these recurrent infections cause filling of these bronchi with pus. Now the pus has been expectorated and what we are left with is a fixed dilated bronchus and there are multiple of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But this condition, which we discussed previously, is referred to as bronchiectasis. So bronchiectasis, by definition, is chronic necrotizing infection of the bronchi and bronchioles associated with abnormal permanent dilation of these airways. So uh, firstly, as you saw in the case scenario, and see, there were repeated bouts of uh, infection, infection with various organisms, and uh, the, the intensity of uh, subsequent infection has been increasing over the years. Now, there is a severe necrotizing uh, sort of infection and inflammation with the permanent dilation of the airways. Permanent dilation is because of destruction and changes in the bronchial walls in the form that uh, the mucosal linings are damaged the ciliary apparatus is damaged, the muscle wall is damaged, there is fibrosis and uh, there is uh, loss of elasticity of the bronchi. So they remain fixed and permanent like a PVC pipe. So cough, fever and copious foul spend, smelling purulent sputum are the characteristic clinical features of uh, this condition, bronchiectasis. Now, what are the causes of bronchial uh, bronchiectasis? The first and the foremost being obstruction of the bronchi. The most common cause of obstruction of the bronchi is because of uh, mucus plug or mucus impaction. Then we have uh, conditions such as tumors, foreign body, uh, diffuse obstructive airway disease that is sometimes uh, it happens in uh, atopic asthma or allergic asthma and chronic bronchitis. As we saw previously in the diagram, there is an overlap between these conditions. So this bronchiectasis could be an outcome of uh, atopic asthma or bron chronic bronchitis if they persist for a substantial period of time. So obstruction and uh, first there is, say for instance, if we have a, a mucus impaction, the air in the pockets distant to the bronchus, where the mucus is being impacted, they, the air is reabsorbed. When the air is reabsorbed, there is collapse of that segment and that collapse is referred to as atelectasis. Now, because of the damage to the mucociliary apparatus, there happens to be infection and this infection basically leads to uh, a chronic sort of uh, inflammation with necrotizing uh, inflammation. So, that's how this obstruction ultimately results in a severe necrotizing infection or pneumonia of that segment of the lung. The same is true with other sort of obstructions such as tumor, body, tumor, foreign body, and so on and so forth. Then we have congenital hereditary conditions such as congenital bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, intralobular sequestration of lungs. Uh, for example, in cystic fibrosis, we have uh, number one, um, uh, there is some uh, abnormality of the mucociliary apparatus. There is thick tenacious mucus secretion and uh, that leads to obstruction of the airways uh, followed by uh, infection. Then there are immunodeficiency states, immotile serious syndrome and cartagenous syndrome. Cartagenous syndrome we will be discussing in subsequent slides in which uh, bronchiectasis is a component part of uh, this syndrome. Then we have necrotizing pneumonias caused by Staph aureus, bacillus, and mixed infections. Uh, they may also lead to bronchiectasis. First, there is infection, uh, pneumonia, that is followed by bronchiectasis. So bronchiectasis is essentially a severe necrotizing inflammation of the bronchi and bronchioles, which are associated with production of copious amount of purulent sputum, 
plus fixed dilation of uh, bronchial walls and bronchi and bronchioles because of some destruction and changes in the walls, mostly in the form of fibrosis. It's a chronic, chronic inflammatory uh, process, so that is mostly followed by fibrosis and fixed dilation of bronchi and bronchioles. Here you can see there is a chest X-ray, although chest X-ray has not been labeled as very precise for quantification of bronchial cases, but still you have, you may appreciate increased bronchovascular markings uh, as compared to the, ideally we should have a normal X-ray beside, but here you can appreciate that the uh, translucency of the lung is basically uh, loss, the air is less and the, the, the vascular markings are very uh, prominent. Then we have uh, certain ring shadows. The ring shadows basically are characteristics of bronchiectasis. They appear at the end of the bronchi and bronchioles and uh, they are in the form of uh, crescents or rings. Uh, we will see in subsequent slides. Then we have pulmonary vasculature. Normally we have shadows of uh, aorta and uh, pulmonary uh, veins and arteries, but they are not very uh, distinct in this X-ray. So mostly there is loss of air, translucency, and there is more opacity in the form of increased bronchiovascular markings. That's all you can appreciate in this X-ray. This is another one which is showing the ring shadow, which I mentioned to you. Here you can see this is a ring shadow. This is a ring shadow. This is more, more precisely being appreciated by uh, radiographers and uh, X-ray specialists. But here you can see this uh, uh, and on ring uh, shadow is one of the characteristics of bronchiectasis. Overall, there is reduction in the uh, air uh, component of the lung field and prominent uh, vascular marking. In this X-ray, you can appreciate the brunt of the bronchiectasis is mostly on the right side of the lung and the lower half of the right side. Here you can see this is the right side. And uh, because of this uh, uh, bronchiectasis and fibrosis, we may appreciate some shift of the mediastinum to the right side because the air component is lost and there is collapse of the segments of lung. So the, uh, the mediastinum is basically pushed to that side. So there is shift in the right shift in the mediastinum, which, which is very slight one. The loss of air shadows and increased bronchovascular markings with, of course, ring shadows of uh, bronchiectasis, which are characteristic findings. Another X-ray, which is in which in this X-ray you can see the right uh, half of the lung is uh, mostly affected by bronchiectasis. There are ring shadows, increased bronchovascular markings, and there is an obvious shift to the uh, 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 right side of the lung because of collapse of the of the lung segments, air pockets, and fibrosis. So the whole mediastinum is being shifted to the right side, which is another characteristic finding of severe fibrosis because of bronchiectasis. There is another X-ray in which bilateral bronchiectasis with uh, uh, multiple cyst formations, and these cysts basically are dilated uh, bronchi and bronchioles airways with fixed walls. So this is sometimes also referred to as cystic bronchiectasis. It is a severe form of bronchiectasis involving both lungs. This person uh, must be very compromised in its in his or her oxygen saturation. And this is a condition which may require lung transplant. This is a fibrosis, as you can appreciate, is an irreversible process. Then we have uh, this CT scan of the lung. Here you can appreciate well over, over the CT scan that these are the basically dilated bronchi and bronchial. There is thickening of the wall of the airways, which uh, gives a tram track like appearance. This is a double layer thickening of the wall. And here you can see these are the small arrows. They are the tram track or thickening of the wall of the uh, airways, mostly bronchi and bronchioles. And here you can see because of this, uh, in front of this arrowhead, there is a fixed dilation of the bronchi. Very remarkable on, on CT scan. And what is the pathogenesis of this bronchiectasis? 
Pathogenesis begins with obstruction, as we discussed. Obstruction may be because of mucus plaque, obstruction may be because of tumor, foreign body, or anything, even uh, asthma. So there is obstruction in uh, uh, the, the segment of the lung, which is uh, distal to the obstruction, there is air reabsorption and collapse of that segment, which is referred to as atelectasis. Then this collapse segment becomes a fertile ground for uh, inflammation and infection. So there is inflammation of the bronchial walls and infection. The role played by infection, bronchial wall inflammation basically causes weakening and dilation of the walls. There is loss of um, uh, mucociliary apparatus. There is basically loss of muscle fibers and elasticity, elastic fibers, and they are being replaced by fibrous tissue. So endobronchial obliteration, atelectasis, and bronchitasis is the usual sort of uh, progression, uh, progressive scenario. In cystic fibrosis, uh, we have uh, uh, it's a congenital disease in which we have squamous metaplasia with decreased ciliary action, and uh, this results in infection, repeated bouts of infection, and ultimately in necrosis and bronchitasis. So. Obstruction leads to air resorption, air resorption leads to collapse of the segment of the lung and that collapse becomes a fertile ground for inflammation and infection and bronchitis is nothing but CV. Here you can again see this is a gross uh, picture of the lung. Here you can well appreciate how thick and dilated are these segments. And they are dilated up to the periphery of the lung, that is uh, uh, underneath the, the area of the lung, which is underneath the pleura. So normally they are not, but here you can see they are thick walled, fibrotic and fixed, open. They must have been filled with pus or purulent uh, sort of uh, inflammatory exudate, but that is lost, that is removed, and what is remained basically is a thick dilated bronchial segments. Here you can see there is uh, inflammation, as, as we know, there is the, the inflammatory exudate between these two lobes of the lung is basically being uh, uh, results, basically it has resulted in uh, fibrous adhesions between these two um, uh, lobes of the lung and this uh, big fibrous, these fibrous adhesions are because of fibrinous exudate and that exudate basically transforms into uh, ultimately undergoes fibrosis and we have adhesions and this is again a finding of severe infection and inflammation. Again you can see there are dilated and fixed bronchi and bronchioles. This is a photomicrograph, which is showing that this is this had been a bronchus, but there is destruction of the wall of the bronchus that is not appreciable. What is appreciable uh, is, a, is an inflammatory exudate comprising of uh, these inflammatory cells. There are certain giant cells which are also visible in between. And then there is destruction of the wall. So it, it, it gives a picture of just like, a, like an abscess there is loss of epithelium, there is loss of wall, and what remains is a, is a necrotizing inflammatory exudate. There's another case, a 43 year old woman had symptoms of chronic cough, progressive dyspnea on exertion and for more than five years. This is a similar sort of scenario. A middle-aged woman, chronic cough, progressive dyspnea on exertion, and purulent sputum on and off for more than five years. There's a five years history. She denied having any systemic disease and has never smoked. Once she had hemoptysis and came to a clinic with a, where a chest x-ray revealed increased bilateral lower lung, especially right side infiltration and ring shadows. As you can see, the uh, ring shadows are something which are characteristics for characteristic for bronchitis. The chest CT displayed uniform caliber parallel thickening of uh, uh, bronchial walls. That is a tram track sign which we saw previously in the previous slide. 
and uh, dilated bronchi, even cyst cystic like bronchi, which, is, which basically sometimes produces signet ring uh, sign with air fluid level. So these are basically thick walled bronchi, which give this sort of picture on the CT scan. The image pattern was compatible with cylindrical bronchiectasis. So there are various categories of bronchiectasis depending upon the shape of the dilated uh, bronchus and cylindrical being one of them. Uh, the others are fusiform and one more. We will see in the next slide. So <clears throat> there's a similar sort of scenario, repeated infection, five-year history. Uh, hemoptysis means uh, the, the necrotizing inflammation must have eroded the vasculature, uh, resulting in hemoptysis. Then uh, she was admitted for the treatment of pneumonia. She must have consolidation as well. The chest CT displayed uniform caliber parallel thickened bronchial walls. So there is thickening of the bronchial walls with uh, tram track sign, which we saw previously, and dilated bronchi with hands on ring appearance, a ring containing air fluid level, sometimes is also visible. So the pattern has been compatible with cylindrical. Uh, Bronchiectasis. So we have various categories of bronchiectasis: cylindroid bronchiectasis, fusiform bronchiectasis, and secular bronchiectasis. This, 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 these are nothing but the shape which these dilated bronchi uh, take. So we name them accordingly. Uh, morphologically, uh, bronchiectasis usually involves uh, uh, both sides of the lungs, bilateral, uh, lower lobes, until uh, unless it is being caused by a foreign body or a tumor, which is the unilateral sort of phenomenon. Then there is uniform airway dilation. Uh, the complications may include abscess formation, bronchiolar and peribronchiolar fibrosis, in which case the condition or bronchiectasis becomes stabilized. It's an irreversible sort of process. Then clinical features, clinical features, nothing remains. You saw everything, you have, uh, we have discussed everything in the case scenarios, it's a cough, severe and persistent, expectoration, um, large amounts of fall spelling, smelling purulent or uh, pus containing and at times, sometimes blood containing uh, sputum, dyspnea, orthopnea depending upon the, the extent of the disease, if it involves bilateral both lungs, major areas then the patient may be unable to maintain oxygen saturation. So dyspnea and orthopnea are a component, uh, concomitant feature. Then we have fever, corpomonial, metastatic brain abscesses, and even amyloidosis in various uh, organs, inclusive of lungs. Okay. So these are the clinical features which are being uh, associated with bronchiectasis. We discuss them mostly in the case scenarios. Then I talked about the Cartagener syndrome. Cartagener syndrome basically is specific syndrome, autosomal recessive uh, sort of uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a transmission. It, it basically has bronchiectasis, sinusitis, and situs inverses. Situs inverses, uh, as you can appreciate, is basically a reversal of the organs. Uh, in a normal person, we have right uh, liver on the right side, spleen on the left side, then stomach on the left side and uh, so on and so forth. But, but in these patients, uh, this, uh, this uh, sequence is basically tilted. They are basically somewhere in the middle or on the left side. The, all these three conditions, bronchiectasis, sinusitis and situs inversus, which we encounter in Cartagena syndrome are because of the defect in the ciliary action. Even for uh, during embryogenesis, for rotation of organs, ciliary uh, uh, movement is required. The same is true for um, uh, our paranasal sinuses and uh, sinus cleansing plus uh, cleansing of the airways. So when once there is defect in the ciliary action, we may have uh, severe infections, which may result in bronchiectasis. Structural abnormalities of the cilia are there, abnormalities in the microtubules are there, defective cell motility during embryogenesis causing situs inverses. It has also something to do with sperm motility. So there is male uh, infertility or subfertility, uh, ciliary dyskinesia, abnormal movements of cilia. Normally the cilia basically move in a synchronized way in a rhythmic manner, but if they start move, moving haphazardly, 
one cilia in one direction, another cilia in another direction, then it is referred to as ciliary dyskinesia. So the ciliary movement no longer remain effective for removal of uh, organisms and uh, pollutants. So synchrony is required for movement of cilia. So these are all the features which we see in Cartagena syndrome. Uh, then we continue with the case after in the previous one, the lady basically after treatment with intravenous levofloxacin 750 milligram for five days, the hemoptysis and cough got better. Now she received regular outpatient clinic follow-up with three months course of oral erythromycin. Erythromycin is a macrolide drug and these are very effective in, uh, in, in the infections producing uh, pus or purulent sort of infections. Pyogenic infections. Long-term low-dose macrolide therapy proved to be to decrease the amount of sputum and had anti-inflammatory effect for at least a period of three months. So, because this is a condition, bronchitis which persists because there are changes, permanent changes in the bronchi and bronchioles. So that's why the patient may be requiring repeated uh, sort of antibiotic therapy to remain uh, functional. In addition, patients diagnosed with bronchiectasis should be evaluated for underlying etiology, for example, congenital disease or autoimmune disease. And uh, the treatment plan basically is basically includes anti-inflammation, airway clearance, and symptom relief and to reduce infection. So this is this management plan basically persists for uh, the rest of the life of this patient, and uh, he or she may live a, a near normal life with this sort of management. Then we have uh, case two, case one, and case scenario were basically uh, um, synonymous for each, uh, complementary for each other. Uh, we have case two. Case two, a 35-year-old man suddenly developed severe dyspnea with wheezing and is taken to the emergency department. Physical examination, his vital signs included temperature near to normal, 99 degree Fahrenheit, pulse 95, BP 130, 80. Chest radiograph shows increased translucency in all lung fields. Increased translucency means increased air shadow in all lung fields. Increased air shadow means blackening of the lungs on x-rays. More air shadow. Sputum cytology reveals crushment spirals, sharp part leaden crystals and acute inflammatory cells and a background of abundant mucus. So here we do not have uh, much of a purulent sort of uh, exudate. It's mostly mucus and we have certain characteristics such as crushman spirals and sharpwood laden crystals. They are specific for the disease which we will be discussing in subsequent slides. So the main uh, uh, cause of presentation of this patient to the emergency department remains severe dyspnea with wheezing. By now you must have uh, appreciated which sort of uh, disease it is. This is a limitation of online lectures that we may, we may not have any conversation on question and answer session or discussion on the case scenario. But anyway, this uh, case scenario is like this. this. This basically belongs to bronchial asthma. So bronchial asthma is by definition is a chronic inflammatory disorders of the airways that causes recurrent episodes of wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, and cough, particularly at night or in the early morning. So it's an episodic sort of bronchial obstruction and it's recurrent. It has period of uh, remissions and relapses, which we, these are the terms we usually employ in medicine. Remission means uh, again, occurrence of the sort of uh, uh, normal condition and then relapse is the occurrence of the disease. So it is characterized by remission and relapses and it is episodic. And the characteristic features are the breathlessness, wheezing, and tightness in the chest. You must have, most of you must have seen these patients. Features include increased airway responsiveness to a variety of stimuli. Basically, these individuals are sensitive. They basically develop this episode of bronchial asthma because of dust, because of dander, because of fumes, because of chemicals. There is, there is a whole constellation of stimuli which may cause bronchoconstriction in these individuals. So, but every individual is not sensitive. So these are the sensitive ones. 
episodic bronchoconstriction, inflammation of the bronchial walls, and this inflammation is characterized by excessive mucus secretion. So there is less component of infection, as we saw in bronchiectasis, but is a more component of exudation of mucus secretion. Case three, a 35-year-old man comes to a clinic because of a five-year history of episodes of wheezing and coughing. Again, there is a five-year history of episodic wheezing and coughing. The episodes are more common during the winter months, and he noticed that these often follow minor respiratory tract infections. In between these episodes, he can breathe normally. So there, there, there are periods of remission, and then again relapse. Remission, then again relapse. So there is a Family history of asthma, there is no family history of asthma or allergies. Chest radiograph and physical examinations are normal. Serum IgE labels and WBC counts are within normal limits. So there is a contrast between case three and case two. Uh, uh, case two. In case two, we have many eosinophils. And uh, these eosinophils are raised in the, in the, in the blood or in the in the mucus because of uh, some allergic tendencies. But here in the second category, we do not have serum IgE labels and WBC count, they are in the normal limit. Eosinophilus is the WBC IgE labels and they are in the normal limit, no history of allergy. So we have these two main categories of asthma. One is an allergic sort of asthma, which is also referred to as atopic asthma. And this, the case three is another type of asthma, which is called as the non-allergic or non-atopic asthma. It is also referred to as intrinsic asthma. The allergic asthma is also called as an extrinsic asthma. So there is a, extrinsic means there is a definite component of an external agent, which triggers this bronchoconstriction. But here in the second category, we do not have these allergic tendencies, but but the picture remains the same: wheezing and coughing with tightness in the chest and some uh, a troublesome. So, atopic asthma. In atopic asthma, we have evidence of allergen sensitization, often in the patient with history of allergic rhinitis or eczema. So. It's a typical sort of type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. We'll see in the pathogenesis of this condition. We must have learned type 1 hypersensitivity by now. So um, in these patients which have atopic asthma or extrinsic asthma or allergic asthma, in these patients, we can identify the inciting agent by allergen tests in which we induce the allergens in the, in, the, in the subdermal region and we may have wheel and flare sort of reaction, just like we test antibiotic sensitivity or drug sensitivity. So these patients have a definite predisposing cause and that predisposing cause could be pollen, could be fumes, could be dust, could be anything, could be even a smell. So uh, the other category, the case three was of non-atopic asthma. There is no evidence of sensitization in these types, episodes of bronchoconstriction can be triggered by diverse mechanisms, the most common being any viral infection. In non-atopic asthmatic patients, we may have a viral infection and then viral infection may sensitize the airways. The airways become so sensitive that even cold can trigger, even exercise can trigger bronchoconstriction. So you see, in the first category, we have type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, basically that is playing the role and in the second category we have oversensitization of airways because of inflammation or infection some sort of so this is, these are the two major categories of uh, asthma the asthma is further categorized according to the the uh, etiology and the mode of its uh, induction but these are the main two uh, types. there is a diagram from your book which basically depicts the pathogenesis of uh, asthma and the structural abnormalities which occur in the air. Here you can see this is a normal airway. This is a mucus, thin layer of mucus. Then there is lining epithelium. Then there is lamina propria containing blood vessels and few inflammatory cells. Then we have a smooth muscle layer followed by deeper 
sub uh, mucus uh, deeper layer and in deeper layer we have uh, these uh, mucus secreting glands and connective tissue and then there is cartilage so this is from inside out uh, of a bronchial wall or an airway wall but here in the asthma you can see this mucus layers become thickened so there is copious mucus production there is some disruption in the mucociliary apparatus and the lining epithelium then we have thickening of the basement membrane over repeated bouts of asthma this patient develop thickening of the basement membrane this thickening uh, interferes with gaseous exchange as well then we have in the lamina propria large number of inflammatory cells inclusive of these red red cells which are eosinophils it must have been an allergic type of asthma then we have thickening of the smooth muscle wall over the years by uh, by virtue of repeated episodes there is definite thickening of the smooth muscle wall of these uh, basically uh, airways then we have excessive glands in the in the submucosal uh, layers and these glands are responsible for excessive mucus and secretion production so there are mast cells there are eosinophils there are neutrophils here you can see the th2 type helper t cell plays the pivotal or central role just like in any type 1 hypersensitivity reaction what happens once an allergen comes say for instance a pollen or a dander this basically gets attached to this antibody this antibody is already attached to a specific type of cell which is a th2 type helper t cell previously it was called as the helper t cell now this this th2 cell once activated by antigen or allergen it produces certain cytokines like interleukin 4 interleukin 5 interleukin 4 here you can see is a growth factor for uh, this b cell what happens once this th2 cell gets activated by the allergen it produces this growth factor for b cell the b cells become basically they expand they divide they multiply and they form a clone of cells now these clones of cells are all primed with antibodies which are specific for this antigen so they are the b cells which have antibodies over their surface which are basically specific for this antigen so nth2 cell also produce an interleukin 5 which is a growth factor for inflammatory cells inclusive of eosinophils it causes recruitment and activation of eosinophils then once the antigen comes again these primed cells which are already sensitive for this antigen they start producing the constellation of uh, cytokines and chemokines and these are all pro inflammatory they not only cause inflammation excessive mucus production but they, but they also lead to bronchoconstriction okay so there is a constellation of uh, mediators which are released by these cells and uh, this is the mechanism of type 1 hypersensitivity then allergen may also cause direct activation of vagal vagal efferent nerves depicted in the lower section of the diagram and this may also cause uh, increased vascular permeability and bronchoconstriction so in bronchial asthma we have bronchoconstriction excessive mucus edema secretions and most the 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 purulent sort of inflammation which is a hallmark of pneumonia and bronchiectasis this is not there in this uh, bronchial asthma here you can see in the case scenario we saw excessive translucency increased air air shadows so here you can see there is more air than uh, the, the soft tissue shadow in this x ray and this air is filled up to the edges of the of the pleural cavity these are not normally filled with air so there is excessive air so pulmonary hyperinflation we employ the term for this condition excessive air in the lung fields so there is hyperinflation bronchial wall thickening which is not appreciable much peribronchial coughing pulmonary edema pulmonary edema due to asthma so this is this this this, this is a typical x-ray of uh, these patients morphology of thick tenacious mucus plugs crushman spirals are basically uh, mucus plugs these are valves of shed epithelium within the mucus 
and these are referred to as crush mens spiral they they basically are, are can be visualized under microscope in in the mucus from a patient with bronchiolasthenia then we have charcot laden crystals these crystals basically are galactin 10 which are derived from eosinophils so these charcot laden crystals and crush mens spirals are specific for bronchiolasthenia the charcot laden crystals are themselves very potent activators of eosinophils So this is the picture here you can see there is uh, there there are lots of eosinophils purplish cells these are eosinophils with an allergic sort of condition allergic asthma then there is sub basement membrane fibrosis this is the thickening of the basement membrane here you can appreciate then there is uh, muscle hyperplasia in the airways smooth muscle hyperplasia thickening of the basement membrane inflammatory exudate in the form of eosinophils so is an allergic sort of asthma picture micro picture here you can again see well defined thick and basement membrane over to that there is purulent sputum then layer is muscle muscle hyperplasia so these are all characteristics which we see in a biopsy from an asthmatic patient and our last topic of today atelectasis atelectasis basically refers to the collapse of the lung which is basically I, I may narrate the definition. Atelectasis refers to either incomplete expansion of the lungs, neonatal atelectasis because of less um, um, surfactant, or to the collapse of previously inflated lung in adults, producing areas of relatively airless pulmonary parenchyma. What happens whenever there is obstruction to the airways? The distal parts, the air is, is absorbed, reabsorbed, and segment of the lung collapses. This collapse is referred to as atelectasis we have certain categories of atelectasis this is resorption atelectasis compression atelectasis and contraction atelectasis so there is a case scenario we may go through it quickly a 6 year old child puts content of a bag of peanuts in his mouth and then takes a deep breath with the idea of blowing the peanuts out all over his system however he aspirates a peanut during this maneuver one day later that he has a slight dyspnea on examination his temperature is 98.4 degree fahrenheit and normal vitals there are decreased breath sounds on auscultation and a dull percussion note over the right lower lung posteriorly chest ct shows a uh, uh, semi semi circular area of density in the right lower lobe grand stain of sputum shows normal flora so this is a typical sort of scenario there is a foreign body infection uh, in the form of peanut and that resulted in dyspnea uh, and that has basically blocked one segment of the lung if this segment is blocked or bron bronchi is blocked then this supply the, the lung the air in these lungs are, are reabsorbed and that segment of the lung collapses so here this diagram is showing basically collapse of that segment the lung was previously here up till here now it is here it means these areas are collapsed because of obstruction obstruction leads to resorption of whatever air was there and then collapse of the segment this sort of atelectasis is referred to as resorption atelectasis it happens whenever there is obstruction to the airways and and resorption of the air in that segment so the lung volume is diminished and the mediastinum shifts towards the atelectic lung so whenever there is collapse it pulls the mediastinum towards its own side so there is shift of the mediastinum towards the atelectic areas so this was the resorption atelectasis there is another condition a 56 year old man with ischemic heart disease undergoes coronary bypass grafting procedure under prolonged general anesthesia usually in the in the bypass surgery high, uh, coronary bypass surgery we have prolonged anesthesia of several hours two days post operation he experiences increased respiratory difficulty with decreasing arterial oxygen saturation on examination he is afebrile respiratory rate 20 hr 70 bp 135 by 85 hemoglobin remains normal pre operative was 13.7 post operative was 13.7 grams per deciliter after coughing a large amount of mucoid sputum his condition improves basically this patient also has uh, an element of obstruction and that obstruction of the airways was because of excessive mucus excessive mucus we encounter in post operative conditions whenever there is prolonged uh, sort of anesthesia so that's why when he expect Created that sputum uh, containing uh, containing mucoid sputum, mucus. His condition improves because the foreign body obstruction was removed. 
so there is another category which is called as the compression atelectasis compression atelectasis happens whenever there is compression of lungs from outside what is outside the lung is the pleural cavity pleural space so whenever there is pleural effusion pneumothorax here in the pleural cavity then we have uh, elevated diaphragm in bed ridden, ridden patients uh, in patients with ascites we have elevated diaphragm and during and after the surgery these basically uh, pleural effusions and uh, compression from outside cause atelectasis in the lung because of external forces so here is a compression atelectasis here you can see there is fluid in this area and this fluid has pushed the lung and it has caused collapse of these segments so there is atelectasis because of external pressure something within the pleural cavity or it could be because of pressure from the diaphragm if a patient is prolonged bed ridden there could be ascites because the ascites may push the diaphragm and they they may cause compression of the lower segments of the lung leading to lower segment atelectasis so basal atelectasis basically is because of elevated position of the diaphragm so this is the compression atelectasis the previous one was resorption atelectasis then we have contraction atelectasis contraction or secretorization atelectasis occurs with either local or generalized fibrotics whenever there is excessive fibrosis in the lung then these basically the lung becomes shrunken it no more remains expansive or elastic so that condition is referred to as contraction atelectasis it may follow severe pneumonia severe infections of the lung and it may also cause hypoxia so that was the topic of the remaining components of obstructive lung diseases and uh, basically we have learned in this session bronchiectasis bronchial asthma and uh, lastly atelectasis and this was all in context of obstructive lung diseases previously you basically learned uh, chronic bronchitis and emphysema so here we are finished with the topic of copd and obstructive lung diseases and these are uh, common diseases and they are frequently asked in the examination i would recommend you to go through the case scenarios multiple times so that so that you may pick the differences between these different categories of uh, obstructive diseases thank you very much